Okay, well, um, as Katrina mentioned earlier, thank you so much for joining us today. We have a great um, program prepared tonight. Uh, we are going to hear from Peter Norton, the author of Atanarama, The Illusory Promise of High-Tech Driving. So before we start, um, we just wanna give a little housekeeping. So um, if you, there will be a interactive question and answer period at the end of Peter's presentation. So if you wanna leave your questions and comments in the chat, you are able to do so. And, um, or you can, during that interactive period, raise your hand and unmute yourself. So prior to that, we please ask that you stay on mute. So that way um, there's no echo or feedback during the presentation. And during that interactive Q&A, we would ask you to be respectful and listen to other participants and not cut anyone off and just make sure that we are, um, again, being respectful. And so just the last thing on Zoom, if it, if it gave you a weird name or it's not your name, just update it. So that way we all know who we're, who we're talking to when we get to that uh, portion. Um, so just another announcement is that there are some upcoming events uh, from APA Suncoast. So please keep your eyes open for those as well. And so now to start the program, we are going to have Katrina Corcoran talk a little bit about some, some of, uh, some of the, uh, innovative things that are happening on the Tampa Bay region or the Suncoast area. So I'm gonna introduce uh, Katrina. She's a senior planner at Hillsborough and she, uh, Plan Hillsborough and she assists with transportation related policy, strategic plan implementation and special area studies. She currently leads the update of the bus emphasis corridors text amendment within the unincorporated Hillsborough County comprehensive plan intended to make it easier to build more dwelling units along roads that have regular bus service. She is also leading the update of the mobility section of the Tampa Comprehensive Plan. She previously served as a planner with the consulting firm Renaissance Planning before joining Plan Hillsborough. Katrina graduated from the University of South Florida, Go Bulls, their Master in Urban and Regional Planning program. In her spare time, she loves walking and biking around downtown Tampa and drawing in her sketchbook. She also enjoys spending time with her friends, family, and two rescue cats, Max and Macy, who were adopted from the Bahamas. So Katrina, whenever you're ready, you can just take it away. Thank you so much, Corinne. And uh, everyone, I just have to give a shout out not only to our entire Suncoast board because they're always planning these wonderful events on their own time, and this is a volunteer thing, um, but a special shout out to Corinne because she has handled uh, almost all of the planning for this, um, getting into touch with Peter and just flawlessly um, making sure that everything was done. And those of you who requested a free signed book, you received that from Corinne. Um, just really, really great job in planning this event today. Um, so uh, next slide, please, Corinne. So uh, just some background information on APA South Coast. We are a division of the Florida chapter of the American Planning Association or APA. Uh, we consist of Citrus, Hernando, Hillsborough, Manatee, Pasco, Pinellas, and Sarasota counties. So we are one of the largest sections in Florida. Uh, we aim to provide our diverse membership with an equally diverse range of professional development, networking, and other opportunities, uh, such as this event today. Um, you can follow us on LinkedIn and on Facebook, and we also have a website available. Um, we do send out newsletters to our um, to our uh, Sunco section members. So that should, should be in your inbox if you are part of the section and you live or work in one of these counties. Uh, we also have a uh, quarterly book club. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us for more information on that. Uh, they just met recently and they discussed Peter Norton's book. So very exciting on that. Um, next slide, please, Chris. So uh, I'm just gonna give some very general information here on uh, autonomous vehicles. So there are six levels of automation. You have no automation that, you know, standard car manual control, as you can see with the cute picture here. Uh, your second level, level, you'll have driver assistance. So that can be uh, cruise control. So the driver, um, had their speed parameters set, but the driver is still operating the vehicle. There's, next, there's partial automation where the vehicle can steer and accelerate. Um, that could be uh, backing out of a spot, the vehicle senses something and it breaks for you. Uh, next, there's conditional automation. So um, the sensors have a wider net and there's that environmental detection, but the human can still override it. 
Um, the fifth level would be high automation. So a vehicle performs all tasks under specific circumstances. Uh, an example could be sometimes Teslas can drive and change lanes on a highway. Um, and there are certain speed and free flow requirements that need to be met. And finally, there's full automation. So the vehicle performs all tasks under all circumstances um, and human interaction is unnecessary. So those are the different levels that we've seen today as we progress towards automated vehicles. Next slide, please. And then we did want to just show you a couple of local AV examples um, in our Sunco section area. So we have the Heart Smart AV. This is a free and fully autonomous vehicle that serves customers near Tampa's Riverwalk. Um, it will serve riders at three stops, Armature Works, Waterworks Park, and the Straw Center. Um, it'll be operating Monday and Sunday, or Monday through Sunday, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. And the new pilot ser service will consist of two autonomous shuttles and will operate until, um, it looks like that was actually, that operated until January 1st, 2022. Um, there was also the AVA shuttle, which was a PSTA shuttle in Pinellas. Um, that first provided service in St. Petersburg from November 2020 to March 2021. And it is back and launches again April 28th, which, and it ends, on, it ended in June 12th on, in downtown Dunedin. So those have um, been around for a little bit, keep popping up with new different examples of autonomous vehicles in our section. And next slide, please. And I'm happy to present our featured speaker tonight. Uh, Peter has been wonderful to work with for this event. And uh, just to give some background on Peter, he is an associate professor of history in the Department of Engineering and Society at the University of Virginia. He has also been uh, a visiting faculty member at the Technical University of uh, Eindhoven in the Netherlands and is a member of the University of Virginia's Center for Transportation Studies. He is the author of Fighting Traffic, The Dawn of the Motor Age in the American City uh, through MIT Press and of Autonorama, The Illusory, Illusory Promise of High-Tech Driving, which is Island Press um, from 2021. He is a winner of the Abbott Payson Usher Prize of the Society for the History of Technology, and he is a frequent speaker on the subject of sustainable and equitable urban mobility. So we're very excited to have Peter here tonight. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Peter. Thank you so much, Katrina. I'm going to um, share my screen. And go. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful to Corinne for the table playing and to Katrina, who was very helpful in that regard as well. Um, and thank you also, Katrina, for that kind um, invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with planners because I'm a planner wannabe. I'd love to be a planner. I sort of daydream about it. I think of you as the people who make things happen. I know that in reality that often is a frustrating experience, trying to do the best you can for a community that is often divided about what it wants. But um, the whole problem of finding the best way to serve a community as it plans its future is a fascinating one to me. Um, I also want to stress that uh, some of the applications of the technology that you just saw from Katrina could be wonderfully beneficial, uh, for example, in connecting residents to transit uh, so that they can make better use of transit. Um, these sorts of applications of technology to driving could be wonderfully beneficial. My book is a caution against the predominant message that we've been getting from the people selling the tech and selling the cars. I think the predominant message is one that we should listen to very critically and listen to also mindful of the lessons of history. So I come to this uh, talk as a historian with the conviction that we learn from experience. This is true for, for us as individuals. As a small child, I learned not to touch uh, an iron while it was plugged in. It was a lesson I learned the hard way, but I think we can learn this lesson the easy way if we learn from other people's experience, including the, the experience that we share in the form of the past. Um, in terms of history, though, we are all limited by our memories, our lived experiences, which might go back a generation or two. But the lessons I want to draw upon for this talk uh, go back uh, 
almost 100 years. I know that some of you have read the book, which, you know, I'm very pleased about. I know that some of you also have not seen or read the book. So I've planned this talk. So I hope it will be of interest to both. If you've read it, it will bring you a, a visual angle that is much richer than what the book could offer with its limits on illustrations. If you haven't read it, I think you will quickly understand uh, what I am trying to propose uh, from a study of the history of how we got to the present uh, sort of um, enthusiasm from the tech companies and the automakers about the possibilities of high tech driving. So as I said, I'm a historian. Autonorama is my second book. My first book was a historical study. And what unites these two books is the fact that after I wrote the first one, I felt like I had a front row seat on the uh, insider's discussions, the discussions within the auto industry and among their allies about how to sell a city where people drive everywhere, even if driving everywhere doesn't work very well for most cities. And what this gave me was maybe something a little unusual, which was a capacity uh, of looking at the current salesmanship for high tech driving, especially in cities, with an alertness to that um, kind of messaging and how it works. Um, and I want to suggest to you that if I had to distill the message of the book down to just a paragraph, it would be the words of Rachel Carson. Some of you may recognize her. I think most of you will recognize her book, uh, Silent Spring, which is about, um, it came out in 1962, was a bestseller and cautioned that the chemical companies that were selling pesticides as the way to solve all of your gardening, farming, forestry problems were actually not solving anyone's problems in the long run and were making the problems worse. Now, what does this have to do with autonomous vehicles? Well, um, as planners, I think you'll all be familiar with Jane Jacobs and the death and life of great American cities in the book that she wrote. And that book came out just uh, a year before Silent Spring. And they have very similar messages. And the message is if you go into a complex system, whether it's a garden or a farm in Carson's case or a city in Jacob's case, you're dealing with a system where if you try to solve one problem, you will disturb a network of innumerable nodes where, you know, fixing one node in the network will have unintended effects on other nodes in the network. And their caution was remarkably similar. I, I wish that these uh, two authors had had a chance to meet. Rachel Carson didn't really live long enough for that to happen because I think they would have had a fascinating conversation. They were offering the same kind of, con uh, uh, of caution. Um, Jacobs, in effect, was saying that a city is like a garden. If you go to a city intent on solving problems, you will cause problems. Instead, what she recommended is what Carson recommended, and that is going in and working with the system, seeking balances rather than solutions, looking for tools rather than ways to eliminate all of your, your problems. That's very much the situation that I think we have with cities and city transportation. Rachel Carson offered this uh, line from page eight of Silent Spring, the chemical war is never won. And by the, this was a metaphor. She's saying that when you try to eliminate all insect pests in agriculture or gardening, uh, in effect, you're waging war against them they always win. And the question then is why? Why do the insects always win? Well, if you kill off 99.9% .9 of them, the remaining 0.01% uh, are the toughest 0.01% and they multiply and you now have an even tougher insect pest than you had before. In other words, the environment adapts and responds to your intervention in it. Exactly the same thing happens with transportation. Um, this is why I think Carson is offering us wisdom that we need to apply to cities. Take the word chemical, 
try replacing it with word, the word traffic and we get the same kind of statement with the same validity. So here I just took out the word chemical, replaced it with traffic, and I think the message is just the same. Uh, I think you might even find that your, in, your experience driving around Florida or mine driving around Virginia tends to confirm that every time we try to relieve traffic congestion by waging war on it in the form of ever more capacity, we end up with even more traffic than before for almost the same reason that we end up with more insect pests. In other words, the environment changes in such a way that the problem comes back worse than ever. So here we see a message. This is from the Portland Cement Association, 1948. They sold the material that made a lot of highways. They're saying, this is now a different metaphor. And instead of a war metaphor, it's a medicine metaphor that highways cure congestion. They, they end it uh, completely. Um, this is, uh, of course, an intervention that, as you all know, will tend to sort of incentivize people to drive more than they did before. That's a response that creates traffic even as you're trying to relieve it. Now, if you take this kind of approach and you pursue it for generations, you can get something like this. This is not uh, a manipulated photograph or artwork. This is an actual photograph of the Katy Expressway. It's part of Interstate 10 west of Houston. And right now in 2022, the Texas Department of Transportation is saying that this road is now congested again and they should be expanding it even more. The logic of this, I think, is a little bizarre. The tech in high-tech driving, whether it's autonomous vehicles or uh, advanced driver assistance systems in some cases, is presented to us as an alternative to this kind of thing. I want to suggest to you that in some ways actually exacerbates the problem. So this is an illustration of an attempt to solve traffic with a kind of warlike metaphor uh, of reproach. And here's where I suggest that we remember Rachel Carson. I don't think of my argument as original. I think of my argument as an adaptation of Rachel Carson's argument to transportation. We are still seeing the same message that we've been seeing for about 90 years that we can solve congestion, we can eliminate it entirely. This is an ad from General Motors from about a year ago, and it's promising a future without congestion, this time through technology. This is the promise of high-tech driving. I propose that it's an illusory promise. First of all, it's not a new promise. This is a 2020 ad from a company that makes uh, the technology for automated driving. Now, they had a predecessor company. It was called Thompson Electric Products. And this is an ad of theirs from 1958. It is, in effect, the same company selling the same promise. In both cases, they're selling uh, a car that will drive itself as a solution to traffic problems. As you can see, it's essentially the same message, and we are really scarcely any closer to the picture on the left now than we were in 1958 when that was made. I, that's a bit of an overstatement. We have Waymo, we have some shuttles like those that Katrina mentioned, but we are nowhere close to having uh, automated vehicles that even have a chance of relieving traffic congestion or of making our roads much safer than they are right now. I, I don't intend for you to take my statement on trust. Uh, I, I hope you'll receive it critically. And um, when we get to questions, uh, your toughest questions are the most welcome of all. Uh, they're the ones we really need to get to. But uh, before that, let me let me try to present my case a little further. So to go back to Rachel Carson again, she offers us a distinction. And this is where I'd like to make the bridge between her and transport technology. On the left, that's supposed to be a magic wand. That's my attempt to illustrate the idea of a solution. A solution is something that solves your problems for you. On the right is a hammer. It solves nothing for you. 
it's a tool you have to choose the right tool for the job and you know have to know how to use the tool and you also have to know what you want to achieve in the end and why and i propose to you that when we mistake a tool for a solution we're in trouble because the solution absolves us of responsibility purportedly for choosing the solution to the problem that we want it proposes to solve it for us rather than us solving our problems with the tool i think this is in a sentence this is rachel carson's message chemical pesticides are a tool they're never a solution i have the same message about high-tech driving it is a useful tool it is not a solution this idea is attributable in part to Arthur C. Clarke. That's a name you might recognize because he was most famously one of the, or the main author of 2001, A Space Odyssey, the 1968 science fiction movie about uh, a journey uh, into space. Now, Arthur C. Clarke said something, I think, profoundly important. Uh, he said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. He said that in the same year that he wrote 2001 A Space Odyssey because uh, that it was technology that helped make that film credible to its viewers, even though it was depicting astronauts going to the moons of Jupiter in, in just 33 years uh, after the film was made. Now, I think this, the significance of this statement is often missed. Magic is not only impressive, it has another effect that's profoundly important. Magic also tends to make us believe that what we thought was impossible is possible. It makes credible what we thought was incredible. All of us have had the experience of encountering new technology, whether that was an iPhone or web search or something of that kind, where the first times we used it, it was breathtakingly impressive. And in, in that respect, it was like magic. And in that respect also, it tended to make us believe that anything's possible. Now, if you're in the business of selling something, that's a powerful effect because it means that what you're selling, uh, you, your potential market stands the chance of believing that it will do almost anything. It's just a chance, a job of connecting that promise to state-of-the-art technology. So if we we go back to uh, ZF's promise, uh, for, forgive me, I'm just gonna skip that. Here we have um, an outline of uh, the rest of the talk um, and of really the book as well. So the book proposes we've been given four generations of these promises beginning in 1940 with Futurama 1 and that we've been getting these promises approximately every 25 years. That's just approximate, of course. There's nothing uh, magic about that timing. Um, but the timing is significant because between these episodes of credibility in 1940 to 2015, there were, there were periods of skepticism. And in fact, as the, as the timetable here suggests, we are entering one now. The hopes that people had for autonomous vehicles in 2015 were much higher than they are just seven years later. And I think this is a part of a pattern. Once our credibility has been raised and then disappointed, we are inevitably skeptical. And it takes time for that skepticism to be relieved. So, um, I'm going to walk you through uh, these four Futuramas uh, and then, uh, then conclude with some suggestions about how to escape from these illusory promises. I want to begin before Futurama uh, when there was something I'm going to call common sense mobility that's uh, nothing magic or particularly impressive about it, but it tends to work. And we hear a lot about sustainable, inclusive, affordable mobility today in the form of walkability, cycling, and really reliable and efficient transit service. I think uh, I'd propose calling that common sense mobility because it's sort of uh, no nothing too uh, difficult to understand about it. It's not like autonomous vehicles where you have to be an expert to, to understand it. And a lot of what common sense mobility can do is very impressive. It's also not new. If we go to any American city of more than a hundred years ago, 
here we see Rochester, we see what we would today call sustainable, affordable, inclusive, and equitable mobility. We see most of the people in this shot are walking. I have circled in red all of the bicycles, including packed bicycle racks. This is 1904. We have EVs. Uh, these EVs, these electric vehicles, are electric streetcars. They're powered by the combustion of coal, which of course is not sustainable, but we could generate this electricity in other ways. These do not need the lithium ion batteries that EVs require to work, which is a huge practical advantage. They draw their current from overhead wires, as you can see in the picture. Um, I'm, I often hear people object that before cars, everybody was on horses. As you can see from this picture, horses are actually quite rare in urban mobility at this point. There were just other better ways to get around. So urban mobility like this is not new. Here's Milwaukee, more of the same. I could give you a lot more pictures. This is Detroit, 1917 in the Motor City. And you can see enormous capacity in the electric vehicles here. There's only five in the foreground, but each of those vehicles can easily carry 50 people. Uh, we see a lot of walking in the Motor City. Uh, there's some driving too. And um, there's this is a this is what a lot of planners are aspiring to today. I think there may be some inspiration to be had in how it was achieved 100 years ago. Now, these things don't mix well with automobiles. Here we see people trying to board or alight from a streetcar. The streetcars rode in the center of the, tr of the streets. The rails were in the center of the streets. They mixed poorly with automobiles, and as automobiles proliferated, this was, above all, a safety problem. Uh, safe, uh, the annual casualties or fatalities rose uh, up to f over 15,000 a year by 1923, which was a year when most Americans still did not own an automobile. Most families had no automobile yet at that point. By about 1930, about half of families had a car. Here we see the kinds of people who are being hit in cities. So this is for large cities like Philadelphia. Three quarters of the people killed were pedestrians and a very disproportionate share, as you can see from the bar graph on the right, were children ages four to eight years old. Now today, people would say, where were the parents? Why weren't they watching these children? That was not the answer in the 1920s when the outrage was directed at the automobiles and their drivers. This is a New York Times depiction of the problem. And I think you can tell from this image that the blame here is not going to the people in the street. The blame is going to the vehicle and its driver and to ultimately to those who are proposing that we make our cities places primarily for cars. I could give you countless illustrations of this kind of anger and antagonism uh, for cars for this problem. The point is people were not responding as we tend to now and say, how do we get people out of the way of vehicles? Rather, they were saying, how do we make streets safe for people on foot? Which is a question we should be asking again today because we need sustainable and healthful mobility. Uh, and I should say that for a Florida audience, it's particularly relevant because Florida, as I think you know, has a particularly troubling history, uh, recent history, in terms of its pedestrian safety record. These images uh, I'm showing you simply to illustrate that the uh, children and pedestrians struck were not blamed for their carelessness. Rather, the problem was attributed to vehicles and their domination. This got to the point that even um, memorials were dedicated to the child victims of these uh, catastrophes. Uh, and the implicit message of these monuments to children killed by motorists, uh, of which there were several in the 1920s, is that children have a right to the street. They have a right to the safe and convenient use of their own local streets. Now, that's a concept that's practically foreign to us now. Uh, it's normal for human beings to respond to an unfamiliar perspective with skepticism. But I want to suggest to you that maybe it's time we revisit this perspective because we have children who can't safely navigate their own neighborhoods even today. 
Uh, this is the St. Louis Monument. Uh, these were in several cities and they signified this notion that children have a right to the safe and convenient use of their own local streets. Speed was faulted. And because speed was faulted, the high tech proposals of the 1920s were for automatic speed governors. This is what this uh, newspaper ad is calling for. It was in Cincinnati in 1923, 42,000 people signed petitions saying, we want a law that says that every vehicle licensed to operate in the city of Cincinnati will have a mechanical speed governor that will prevent the vehicle from being able to go faster than 25 miles an hour. So that was for 1923, the technology response for safety. Now this proposal was crushed in a referendum that November, in part because the people who wanted to sell cars organized a much more lavish publicity campaign against the proposal uh, as illustrated in this newspaper advertisement from the time warning people that the city would have an economic disaster if they voted against this ordinance. Now the proposal really mobilized the people who wanted a future for cars and cities and by that I mean the auto makers, the auto clubs, the auto dealers, the taxi cab companies and others and they tried to characterize these sorts of proposals as intolerable restrictions on the automobile. And their message was, we have to redefine safety as making streets safe for drivers and uh, rather than making streets safe for pedestrians. That was captured in this editorial in, the, in a journal read widely by road builders. ENR, the journal is still with us today. I'm sure some of you have seen ENR, which city planners, of course, do read. It's primarily a civil engineering journal. And this effort to redefine what city streets are for, i.e. they were for drivers, was a far-fetched, ambitious notion then. It was substantially successful, however. There were many ways in which this was done. I do not have time to review them all with you. But one illustration is to convince people that walking in the street, except in a highly limited way, was jaywalking and was no longer tolerable. And these cards are from jaywalking campaigns used to spread that idea and to spread it with substantial success. Now, I want to begin uh, with the Futuramas. This is Futurama 1 coming up. Uh, and Futurama 1, I, I should mention the, the word. Uh, probably most of you have heard of the original Futurama. It was an exhibit in New York City at the New York World's Fair of 1939 and 1940. It was an exhibit made by General Motors and it was a visual experience where fairgoers saw a gigantic uh, model of the city of 1960, the city of 20 years in the future. And General Motors wanted, wanted a word for this model and they combined the words diorama with the word future to come up with Futurama. And the Futurama exhibit was in an exhibition hall called Highways and Horizons. And the horizon metaphor is a very significant one. They chose it because it, it evokes a future that always recedes as you approach it. And therefore you have to keep going towards it forever. This was their metaphor for Futurama. You have to go there forever. Now, a vice president for General Motors, an engineer named Charles Kettering, I'm sure some of you have heard of Charles Kettering, had a, uh, a message for his colleagues in the motor business. This, this article he wrote for readers who were in the automobile business, and his message was keep the consumer dissatisfied. Now, this is the horizon metaphor. He's saying it, once people get to their destination, they don't need to go anywhere anymore, they'll stop. He said, if you want customers to keep coming to your dealership uh, or to your business, you cannot deliver exactly what they want because then they'll be satisfied and they'll stop coming. What you have to do is constantly promise them that there's something better awaiting them after the next purchase beyond the horizon. So I think you can see the, the significance of the metaphor here. This is really kind of transport consumerism. He's selling not just cars here, but a future of ubiquitous 
driving uh, a future that can't be achieved just like you can't get to a horizon it always recedes before you but that's that's its advantage if you're selling that's not a flaw that's not a bug it's a feature because the fact that it recedes before the consumer as the consumer approaches it means you have something more to sell them now what is the this horizon look like um, an engineer in the employ of motordom uh, which is what the automobile business called itself as a general term at the time promised a future of foolproof highways this is from 1934 this article and uh, now there is no such thing as a foolproof highway and the author of this article I think pretty clearly knew this but in promising you could eventually have a highway where crashes are impossible because it's divided because it has shoulders it has grade separated interchanges and so on uh, this is a promise that you can use to continue to sell ever more roads and ever more driving. It was an, an ingenious move, and this is an application of Kettering's principle of keep the consumer dissatisfied. Uh, on the left there, you see uh, Miller McClintock, and, and that quotes him there, working with uh, a man who built a model of this magical city of the future where you can drive anywhere at any time without delay and park for, for free when you get there. A city we're still trying to build today. A city where you don't have traffic lights because all the intersections are grade separated. Well, the Shell Oil Company was actually very interested in this vision. They saw it as a future of unlimited oil consumption. That's how they put it. And so they hired a model maker uh, on the right in the photograph. You can see Norman Bell Geddes. He was a stage designer and an industrial designer. And at the Shell Oil Company's uh, request and with the help of Miller McClintock, Norman Bell Geddes built this model, which was used in Shell advertisements in 1937. And so here you see a vision of the city we are still trying to build, the city where there's no traffic congestion and no collisions because of technology. In this case, it's rather, from our point of view, simple technology. It's the technology of highway engineering with grade separated interchanges, medial divisions, shoulders, uh, marked lanes, and so on. So, uh, to conclude with Futurama 1, uh, the General Motors exhibit was called Highways and Horizons. They evoked the horizons metaphor endlessly. It's a perfect metaphor because of the fact that the horizon always recedes as you approach it and therefore you just have to keep going forever. Um, and it was superbly done. No expense was spared. The model was uh, almost a full acre in size. You can see from this photo it was the most popular exhibit at the World's Fair. You can see the people lined up for hours to take this journey into the future. When you were on this journey, you viewed the city of the future as if from an airplane seat, you sat in a moving chair uh, and you had a view like somebody looking at it through an airplane window. These cars actually moved in their little slots. There were no parking problems because when these little slot cars reached the end of the road, they just went around on the underside of the road and came back at the beginning again. Um, and so it looked like a city where driving everywhere actually works. The reality, of course, was different. These cars did all have to park somewhere. Uh, in effect, the USA tried to build Futurama uh, in terms of putting in all the highways, but because of the parking problem, you have effects like this in Portland, Oregon, which is considered today a very transit and bike friendly city. But as you can see, when they put interstate highways into Portland, Oregon, uh, much of the urban fabric was erased just to store all of these parked cars. So much for the cure, cure for congestion. Uh, you can see that the attempt to do this is destructive. This is Hastings Street in Detroit in 1959. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the black neighborhood of Detroit. The population is basically 100% black uh, because of residential segregation. It wasn't a choice to live here. You had to. Um, the vast majority of the people living here did not own a car. They rode the bus or the streetcar if it was still working in 59 and they walked. Um, 
Nevertheless, in this quest to eliminate all traffic congestion, this was put in. That's the Chrysler Expressway, the Chrysler Freeway. Uh, it's at the same site. This photograph is the same perspective. You can see a church tower that's in the center right of the picture on the left and more exactly in the center in the right hand picture. In other words, the African American community of Detroit was destroyed for to serve suburban commuters and incidentally because of residential segregation the suburban commuters were practically all white uh, in a fruitless attempt to end congestion one of the effects is that the center of detroit today is mostly car storage not actually useful geography because all these cars have to be stored somewhere and belatedly in 2022 the chrysler freeway is a candidate for a freeway removal uh, of course, it should never have been built in the first place. Um, Florida examples are abundant too. You probably know a great many more than I do. I'll give you one quick one. Wilbur Smith Associates was the number one uh, planner, uh, transportation planner for these projects uh, in this 1957 plan for Tampa. This is the plan. That black and white photograph with the red lines is straight out of that book. The only part that's not out of the book is the blue. I put the blue on so you could more easily see Central Avenue, which probably many of you know was uh, substantially destroyed by this project because it was built more or less as you can see here. Uh, this is uh, an attempt to turn Tampa into a place where you can drive anywhere at any time without delay and park for free when you get there. I don't have to tell you that that's not a destination we've re re reached. It's a receding horizon that, as we approach it, always gets further into the distance ahead of us. Now, people in the 1950s, contrary to what you'll often hear, were well aware that this was not working. The criticisms were abundant. Jane Jacobs is the most famous critic, but by no means the only critic of this kind of urban planning. The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Its very first sentence is, this book is an indictment of conventional city planning. Uh, it was a very well received book as well because this was a, um, a, an affliction that many people recognized as the opposite of what we should be doing for our cities. Now for people who wanted to sell a future of driving everywhere, this was a threat. And to manage this threat, they orchestrated Futurama 2. In other words, try Futurama again, but you can't sell the same promise twice, right? People are skeptical. What they had to do was apply Arthur C. Clarke's dictum that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now, in 1960 or so, the most impressive technology was the transistor. Uh, or electronics more generally, and that was what was used to repackage or retread Futurama as Futurama 1. So to respond to these critiques, uh, they evoked the magic of the electronic age. Uh, with electronics, you can drive and eventually the car will be driven for you by an electronically equipped car or an electronically equipped highway or both. This promise was very common even in the late 50s and early 60s. We tend to think of this promise as recent. It's a very old promise. Uh, Disney even made a, a uh, film called Magic Highway USA. Note the word magic. Uh, this is a suspension of credibility that is a response to impressive technology that people have. They're exploiting this fact. General Motors had an exhibit that they called Futurama 2. They presented it at the New York World's Fair of 1964 and 1965. And now it was the electronics that was supposed to make this future possible. Here we see the city again, a city future. This time it's a city of the future, but as depicted in 1964, depicting the city of roughly 2000. Ford had an exhibit there too called the Wonder Rotunda. And in the Wonder Rotunda, you rode in a Ford car that was pulled along a magic track or the, called the Magic Skyway. Notice the use of the word magic, kind of like the way General Motors used the word horizon. In both cases, it's uh, an enticement, right? 
Uh, here are people riding in For Ford's uh, Wonder Rotunda, seeing the city of the future. It culminated in what Ford called Space City, where they're evoking now the wonder of the space age. And this is supposed to make a future in which you can drive anywhere at any time without and park for free when you get there. Credible again. It couldn't be done in 1940 because the technology wasn't good enough. But now in 1964, with space age tech, with transistors, supposedly we can do it. Let's pursue this future again. Um, now, this has a Florida angle, which I want to sort of inject into here parenthetically, uh, that's uh, in the book, Autonorama. Um, and here you can see for, I'm sorry, Disney himself presenting this idea to the state of Florida in a film not meant for public release, but meant for release to state legislators to help win Florida's government's approval for Disney. So this is still relevant in a way to 2022. You can see he's pointing to where he wants this thing to go and where it was built, of course. Uh, what we know today is Walt Disney World, what he wanted to call the experimental prototype community of tomorrow or Epcot, which he, as you can see, he's locating here near Orlando, Florida on an enormous uh, lot. Now in Disney's version of the future, it's a car dependent future. This is a model of the Epcot city. It was never built. He wanted Epcot to be a real city. Um, and there's car dependency in the sense that you have to drive to get to this place. But once you're there, he wanted it to be like Disneyland in California, a place where you walk everywhere. You know, the centerpiece of Disneyland, Disney World is a, a kind of pseudo Main Street USA where you can walk everywhere or ride transit. That's what Disney wanted. So his version of the future of mobility was a future of high tech mobility but shared mobility. You can see monorails, people movers, but still people access all of this on a subterranean road. Again, none of this was ever built as planned. It was simply too extravagant. And incidentally, Ford died just weeks after he proposed this plan to, to the state of Florida in a privately made film just for the governor and the legislators. He then died and the Disney company said, let's, let's not go do try all this stuff. Let's just make another a theme park called Walt Disney World. Uh, but as you can see, Disney wanted this to be intermodal and even Disney World, of course, is somewhat intermodal. It does have uh, at least the monorail and some people movers. It was supposed to be a walkable place. Now the future actually turned out to be very different, very disappointing in a lot of ways. Here is Orlando adapting to the huge growth in traffic demand of the 1960s some of which was brought on of course by disney world itself this kind of project particularly through larger cities like for example philadelphia was very controversial alice lipscomb was part of a successful movement to stop an expressway to cutting right through the city of philadelphia so you can see what's happening to futurama 2 is kind of what happened to futurama 1 it is being stopped over the fact that it's not delivering on its promises. We have new values like environmentalism. Uh, here you can see uh, that Fifth Avenue has been turned over to pedestrians in honor of the very first Earth Day of 1970. Earth Day was due in part to the Apollo project that showed people uh, that Earth was actually a small oasis of inhabitable space within the vast emptiness of space. This famous photograph from Apollo 17 taken in 1972 called Big Blue Marble uh, actually inspired some of the environmental movement of the 1970s, which is also exemplified by E.F. Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful. Maybe we should, should not try these massive uh, engineering intrusions if we have simpler alternatives uh, because of the unintended consequences that follow from it. This is, of course, the message. Of course, at the same time that Apollo was a justification for Small is Beautiful and for Earth Day, Apollo's tech was also a basis for new promises, a new generation of promises that technology will finally deliver what we always wanted. 
right? Uh, for example, the very first microprocessors ever made were made by Intel in 1970. And they promised that maybe technology can do what it has never done before. This becomes the basis of Futurama 3. Futurama 3 was led by, uh, in particular, by defense contractors who made military electronics who were afraid that as the Cold War ended, they were losing their biggest government market. They were afraid of having to depend on a private sector market because a private sector market is interested in keeping costs down. They wanted a public sector market for their tech. And they said, well, let's sell it to the Department of Transportation. And instead of it being for the Cold War, it will be for a war on traffic congestion. We are going to apply this kind of technology that uh, including the microprocessor. And it's this tech that will give us the credibility that we lost after the failure of Futurama 1 and the failure of Futurama 2. And how did that credibility get restored? Well, many of you will remember the 1980s and the tech of that era and how impressive the personal computer was, which depended on microprocessors. Microprocessors were the basis of new promises that we can do anything now, including things that you always thought were impossible, they're now possible. That was the message now at the new Epcot Center as it actually opened. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, Walt, World, Walt Disney World opened in 1970. Uh, in 1982, the General Motors opened its exhibit called World of Motion. It's no longer there. It was open for about a dozen years. In this exhibit hall, it was kind of like the Highways and Horizons exhibit hall at the New York World's Fair, only this time it's showing a future of including a city where you drive anywhere at any time and park for free when you get there without delay, congestion, or crashes. Uh, this time made possible by, you guessed it, microprocessors. This ride culminated in a model that you can see on the right called Center Core. The name was supposed to invoke the core of a computer, and it was supposed to be a city where um, vehicles moved around like uh, electrons in circuits with absolute speed, efficiency, and reliability. Now, this message was also given credibility through some free publicity that the Pentagon gave to tech companies by virtue of the Gulf War of 1991. Many of you will remember how the TV news, CNN in particular, uh, featured press conferences where the military showed off smart bombs, which only accounted for about seven or eight percent of the munitions used. But that was the munitions that people got to see because it had uh, cameras mounted on it. And in press conferences like this one, you could see those cameras um, showing the soul precisely finding its target and destroying it with surgical precision. And these weapons were called smart weapons. And this is really when the adjective smart, as in smart city, for example, took on its modern connotation. A smart weapon or smart bomb had been in, in use as far back as the 1960s, but it was the Gulf War that made that word a word in general circulation. When the Gulf War ended, uh, people were not yet foreseeing the war on terror of the 21st century. So the contractors instead said, let's have a war on congestion instead. Here are a couple of ads from military tech contractors like Lockheed and Rockwell International. And they are saying, we'll convert our defense electronics to create smart highways for tomorrow. Uh, we will eliminate highway congestion, reduce pollution, and increase safety. These are the messages. They can't be delivered. Uh, but remember, the fact that they can't be delivered is a feature, not a bug. All you have to do is make people agree to pursue that goal. And in pursuing it, you can sell a lot of tech. How was this supposed to work? Well, in the 90s, it was going to be through smart highways. Many of you will remember smart highways. Now, today, people who do remember smart highways tend to think of them as technology that was supposed to deliver some incremental benefits because that's all they ever did. 
what they're forgetting is that in the 80s and early 90s, right into the mid 90s, they were sold as the solution that will eliminate or at least severely reduce traffic congestion and accidents by connecting vehicles to off-road base that would coordinate them and network them together into a, a something kind of like the flows of electrons in a microprocessor. Florida, again, is a, a sort of um, main actor in this drama. Here you see delimited with this uh, boundary line, a test zone for a technology called TravTech. This was done at public expense uh, with um, uh, US DOT money, but also at private expense, General Motors and the American Automobile Association were partners as well. They equipped 100 Oldsmobiles with technology that was supposed to make navigation seamless and faultless. Now these vehicles had human drivers, but they were actually on the roads. Most of them were rental cars. Um, and you would rent a car, let's say you're a tourist in Orlando, and the rental car agency would offer you a chance to be part of this experiment if they had one of these cars available to you. And if you agreed, you would have an onboard navigation system called TravTech. This is a lot like what your phone can do for you now with GPS, only this was more elementary. It had a voice. The voice sounded exactly like the Stephen Hawking voice. It was the, exactly the same synthesized voice. Or you could turn the voice off and just look at this small screen, low res map uh, showing you where to go. You could type your destination and get navigational instructions. Now it was an expensive and big project that lasted two years. And basically what it proved is it helped prevent some people from getting lost. It did not deliver any congestion relief and delivered no real safety benefit either. Now, this was not the end of um, Smart Highways, which incidentally I'm calling Futurama 3. It was never called that, but it's the same message. So I think that's a fair name for it. It was the same message as Futurama 1, the same message as Futurama 2, namely that through tech, we can finally eliminate traffic congestion and prevent all collisions. But uh, the, the reason we can do it now and could never do it before is that we finally have the tech that we need. Now, one of the ways in which this was supposed to work was through what you see here, which is called vehicle platooning. A lot of you have heard of this. The vehicles will sort of form a train with an invisible electronic connection so that the vehicles are spaced closely. Uh, and because they are all communicating with each other, they won't collide even if they're going 60 miles an hour. Now, this was actually done on a test on a closed private road. The segment of road here you see here in San Diego was closed off to the public. And they've got some vehicles here following magnets embedded in the pavement. And they're actually platooning for a little while here as well. Now, this was supposed to be the press was unimpressed the media was unimpressed and that's because they asked some kind of elementary class of questions like what happens when this vehicle train reaches the exit ramp and enters the city you are now going to make traffic congestion on the city streets even worse than before nevertheless this experiment was pulled off this is august 1997 so 25 years ago it's the anniversary really um, and here you see the hands up i think the anniversary is in a couple of days and um, th this test driver is showing off the fact that he doesn't have to have his hands on the wheel. This, of course, is not actually solving congestion, and it's not even really solving safety either, because the vehicle has to both enter the platoon, leave the platoon under manual control. But despite that disappointment, I think you can see the pattern about what you do if you're trying to sell the tech or sell the vehicles. Instead of giving up, you promise Futurama 4. Nothing has ever been called Futurama 4 except by me, but I think we could use that term for the promotions we've been seeing for a future where you can drive anywhere at any time without delay, without crashing, and park for free when you get there, or perhaps not have to park at all because the vehicle will drive away by itself. Um, we could call that Futurama 4 because it's the same promise. I would propose calling it Autonorama because this time the promise is supposed to be achieved through autonomous vehicles technology. Um, 
again, it's the state of the art technology system is conceivable. The first smartphone had the effect of making people feel compelled to believe that amazing technology makes anything possible. I want to stress the technology really is amazing, but amazing technology does not make car dependency work. Now, it earned its credibility in part, again, through public taxpayer money, this time from the Defense Department, uh, actually, again, from the Defense Department. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency was interested in vehicles that could operate off-road in desert environments uh, because of the uh, uh, war on terror. And uh, so they had competition with large prizes for com companies and research universities and automakers and tech companies to compete for the vehicle that can complete a navigation in a desert environment without a human driver. Uh, there were some successes in that, and once there were some, immediately General Motors came up with an exhibit depicting the future. Now, this is from 2010. So the future of 20 years hence is not 1960 more or 1980 or 2000. It is 2030. And so they showed fairgoers the city of 2030. They showed them this eight years ago at a World's Fair or an expo in Shanghai, China. GM teamed up with a Chinese company called Shanghai Automotive Industry Group uh, Company, Psych. And they presented it in an exhibition hall that actually looks a lot like some of the other exhibition halls you've seen. <coughs> Excuse me. Here is the exhibition hall in Shanghai. Uh, here are the three exhibition halls where this has been done. This is not only General Motors. Ford had one of them as well. Um, and you can see there's a, a sort of pattern of architecture in the form of these um, sort of cylindrical exhibit halls. Now, if you, as you walked into the 2010 fair, you saw a promise to you, a future free of emissions, free from petroleum, free from congestion, and free from accidents, made possible by tech. Now, this time it's not just microprocessors. It's the state-of-the-art tech of 2010, most of which is the state-of-the-art tech of today as well. We're now talking uh, about uh, LiDAR. We're talking about uh, networked computing. We're talking about wireless connectivity, for example, through 5G and so on. Here are three stills from a film that you could see if you went to that exhibition hall. It was an enormous screen. It was immersive. The screen curled around the audience so that you had a wide panoramic view of the city of the future. It was supposedly a zero emissions future with all of the vehicles driving themselves, uh, you can see in the bottom view that wind turbines were supposed to supply a lot of this power. Uh, amazingly, even photosynthesis was supposed to supply some of the electric power. The vehicle you see in the center is a concept car developed by Syke and General Motors together. It's only a concept, and the idea is that that leaf-like roof conducts photosynthesis, which, as you know, a leaf that size would conduct enough about enough electricity maybe to turn on a flashlight, but here it is propelling a vehicle. Uh, GM and Psych were quite clear that this would mean you could generate a lot more monetizable data because you would be engaged in social media while you're on the road. This is attractive to companies interested in monetizing our data. Uh, General Motors has continued to offer us this promise. In 2017, they issued a sustainability report promising zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. This is still their tagline in 2022. They're still promising zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. It's, of course, an impossible promise. But, of course, Charles Kettering would applaud. Remember, Charles Kettering, don't promise something you can deliver tomorrow, promise the impossible and keep striving to make it credible. People will therefore keep approaching that ever receding horizon. And to get to that horizon, they will buy what you have to sell. Right. So this is Mary Barra, the CEO's promise today as well. You've seen this before. Uh, you're going to this is GM publicity for this future. 
the person on the left is not having to pay attention to the vote and therefore he's able to engage in social media with his family or i'm sorry a, a, a call with his family a video call or you can take in some entertainment which of course you'll pay for and then the entertainment will figure out what your tastes are and target more to you so this is a big part of the of the cell is the monetizable data that you can generate now that you do not have to pay attention to the road and can pay attention instead to entertainment media and so on right this is the promise too for the shared vehicles where you'll be consuming media on the way this is a big part of what's supposed to make this attractive to investors this is the future that's being packaged for our consumption by the promoters of Futurama 4 or Autonorama. I'm going to conclude by offering some suggestions about how we escape and choose our own future. And that begins with the fact that we should be choosing our own future. We are, at least our ideal is that we're a democracy. As a democracy, we should be the ones choosing our futures together. Planners are experts at finding out the kinds of futures people would like. Once we, the people, choose our future, we can then tell the tech companies and the automakers what we want that would be a good starting point and that begins with remembering that a tool is not a solution a tool is in in effect asking us a question what do we want to do once we know what we want to do what's the right tool for the job it might not be a hammer what is the job that we want to, to pursue and then once we've done all that we choose the tools that empower us to pursue the futures of our choosing. That is completely different from a solution. Now, I think you'll notice that very often tech companies use the word tool and solution as if they are synonyms. I want to propose to you that the difference between these two is profound and profoundly important. And that the confusion we've had is not just accidental. It comes from people who want to sell tools and want to do it by convincing us that they're solutions. That is not my caution. That is originally Rachel Carson's caution. So I want to propose instead that tools include not just high-tech things. We need high-tech things but includes low tech and zero tech things too. Like walkability is a low to zero tech a way to promote sustainable, inclusive, healthful, and affordable mobility. Um, to say that you're for low tech uh, tools does not mean you're against high tech. It means you're in favor of full spectrum innovation. I think you'll notice that when you see the word innovation, it's often implied that innovation only includes high-tech innovation. That's self-debilitating. Some of the best innovations we have to choose from are either low or zero-tech, or they combine components from the whole spectrum, combining low-tech with high-tech, which gives us many more possibilities than we normally get presented with by the people who want to sell us high-tech solutions for everything. Um, on the left here, you see a relatively low-tech solution in the form of, or a tool, I would say, in the form of the electric bicycle. Uh, this has inherent advantages over trying to solve all the problems that you get with an autonomous vehicle. Uh, those problems are implied by this diagram, which tells you all the jobs that the tech on this vehicle has to be doing at all times. This is one of the reasons why there is no future in sight where these vehicles are actually affordable even if they work. We can combine high and low tech to make biking and transit both work better. This bar chart shows you user, user adoption of public transport bikes in the Netherlands. Why is the curve rising? It's because the tech lets people who take bus find a public transport bike which they can get with the same ticket that they use to board the bus so that they can get from the bus station to their final destination. Think about what that means for transit ridership. It means suddenly transit is practical for people who otherwise didn't find it's practical. Suddenly it means you don't have to have a whole lot of parking at the transit station. Uh, suddenly it means also that a lot more people are cycling, which is good for uh, carbon emissions and also, of course, for health and spatial efficiency. Um, I can recommend uh, this video to you from Bicycle Dutch about how 
this has been achieved. A lot of people who hear the Dutch example rule it out. They say, look, the Dutch have a history of civil disobedience against car domination. The USA has a history of car enthusiasm. That is actually a much more complicated picture than we've been sold. We were sold this message, America's love affair with the automobile, which turns out, I didn't know this until about 15 years ago, is a line that was crafted by the automobile companies, specifically GM in this case, to make us sort of agree that this is our culture. But our culture includes skepticism and hostility to cars, skepticism due to circumstances like this one in San Antonio, where in a residential neighborhood, people without a car can't even go to the store without sprinting across their road because the crosswalk is so far away. They're stuck in conditions like this uh, or like this. Uh, Dan Kostelich, Don Kostelich has done a superb job illustrating these conditions. These are old. We see this in Philadelphia. This is 1970. Uh, this picture was called Children Going to School. Uh, and we have an unknown history of resistance to this. Here we see a photo, uh, I had to find this photo in an archive, it's not been publicized until I found it, which shows something that was actually very common in American cities in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, right through the automobile enthusiasm era. You see people blocking streets illegally, demanding walkability, pedestrian safety, and, and other measures to slow cars down and make streets accessible for other users. These protests, and again, these photographs were unpublished until I found them in archives, uh, show that these uh, uh, protests were ubiquitous. They happened in cities large and small across the whole country. Um, here are some of the pictures. The quality is poor because these were pictures that had to be dug up from obscure sources. But they show major protests demanding walkability in the era that gets mischaracterized today as an era of undiluted car enthusiasm. These mothers in Philadelphia are demanding safe streets and they're doing it illegally. You can see in the top picture, the police have arrived and they're trying to figure out what to do about this. Um, these are Philadelphians as well. I happen to find some of my best examples from Philadelphia, but they're from all over the country. The visual examples that I have are predominantly from Philadelphia, but I have text examples from the whole country. Uh, this is uh, Camden, New Jersey. These kinds of criticisms give us confidence that we have a basis for expecting more from our cities than car domination. And I want to close by reminding us what Rachel Carson reminded us of 60 years ago, that a tool is not a solution and mixing up the, tool, the two is what gets us into trouble. Autonorama is an attempt to mischaracterize high-tech driving as a solution. High-tech is a useful tool Let's put it to the uses that we choose for our own purposes, supplement it with low-tech innovation as well, and we will have far more choices than we ever imagined uh, possible. With that, I'd like to conclude uh, and invite uh, any who might have some questions to raise, including tough questions, those are welcome. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now so that uh, Corinne can take over the uh, the meeting. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, Corinne was having some internet issues, so I will be stepping in as the Q&A coordinator. <laughs> um, but th fabulous Great. presentation. Thank you so much for um, giving that to us. And I uh, really love all the visuals. That's, um, that's great for me. I'm a pretty visual person. So I did want to open it up to the group. I've had a couple questions come through, but if anybody wants to unmute, um, please just either raise your hand or unmute and, and we'll go ahead and uh, get into your questions. I'm already seeing some uh, questions still come through the chat, but if anybody would like to unmute, please. Okay, I'm seeing one question in the chat here. It's a little bit of a long one. So let me see if I can read that. And this is from Jim Stanton. Um, the, he says, the problem Peter outlines with historical examples is very similar to the affordable housing crisis where we rely on the private sector and affordable housing nonprofits to essentially implement a public policy imperative. 
Isn't this a similar, a similar corollary for sustainable transportation implementation in your scenario? We are relying on private sector tech and auto companies to implement large scale transportation solutions. This is not what other countries are doing. Is this the paradigm we still need to shift? So I'll leave that to you, Peter. I am, I am, I am grateful to that question because it is very astute. Uh, I suspect others in the audience have had uh, similar thoughts as well. I also want to agree with it most emphatically. Um, to, to, uh, to try to make a big subject manageable in just a minute or two, um, I think there's a very useful analogy with water supply. Everyone needs access to a safe, reliable, and affordable water supply, a no frills water supply. We don't always succeed in this effort in this country, obviously. The Flint, Michigan example is just the most notorious example of many others like it. But at least we do generally agree that supplying safe, affordable, reliable water is a public obligation. We should have the same um, sense of obligation about mobility. What we have instead are state departments of transportation that actually define accessibility as accessibility by car. And that in turn means we're essentially requiring people not only to be able to drive, but also to be able to afford to drive. Um, we're, we're also sort of creating a problem where we know that a large fraction of the population, even if they can afford to drive, cannot safely drive for a lot of uh, reasons that you already know, so I won't review them. Um, we also have state departments of transportation that say if you're a driver and you have a delay, that it's a public responsibility to eliminate or reduce that delay, which is a pretty amazing thing because if you pursue that logic, it means you will be gradually rebuilding your state such that the distances between your destinations uh, and also the crossability of your streets um, become such that it's almost impossible to get around by any other way. In other words, if you constantly try to keep vehicle speeds up, then you create an environment where getting around by any other mode is practically impossible. Now, if we could pursue a public responsibility model where it's public policy that has to provide our, ensure that we have a floor of transportation, we could still let people who choose have cars they can drive, including nice cars. In fact, that's exactly what the Netherlands does. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, car ownership is quite high but people just don't have to drive for everything. They tend to drive much more selectively. We could do that here too. And the benefit is that once you do that, then car ownership becomes an extra rather than a necessity. I'm not meaning to suggest that we don't have a lot of rural areas where for the, a long time ahead, cars are the only way to get around. But I, uh, and incidentally on the affordable housing thing, I have to say one more thing, which is that we do have public policy that supports affordable housing. It's not well known, but it's in the following form. Instead of ensuring that you can get an affordable house that's somewhere near where you work, we make sure that you can drive on a highway fast enough that you can live 50 miles from work where you might be able to afford your house. That is a very inefficient way for a lot of reasons to supply affordable housing. What if instead of ensuring that you can always drive without delay, which never works anyway, we instead ensure that you could live near, near where you work and affordably, that actually would make it easier for everyone who does have to use the roads because it would take a lot of people off the roads. A great question. Thank you for that, Peter. I appreciate the response. Um, I do see um, I do see Rebecca Webster has her hand up. So Rebecca, if you'd like to unmute, I saw you had some emailed questions earlier, so I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Dr. Norton, for your presentation and everything. It was great. Um, my first one, I have a few, but I want to just say one for now. It seems like in the mid to late 1900s, Central Florida was one of the main states that people gravitated to for simulations and testing with Epcot and TravTech in Orlando. Um, are there any reasons that stick out as to why people may have gravitated to Central Florida as opposed to other locations in other states? 
That's a great question. And um, part of it is that it was a non-random sample that I presented. So when I when I'm asked to speak to an audience, I like to have some of the content at least be local or relatively local to that audience. So I deliberately overrepresented Florida because of this being a Florida audience. But that said, I have to add that the, the answer is yes, there are reasons. Um, one is the fact that uh, some of the tech uh, doesn't help you any if you have uh, the kind of weather you could have in, say, the Midwest or the Northeast. Um, now, Florida can have some tough weather, too, but uh, uh, th that turned out not to be the relevant issue in the Florida examples that I offered. Another is the sort of chance fact that Disney happened to pick Florida for his what he called Project X or the Florida Project in the 1960s. And he chose it in part because he wanted a lot of open land, which Florida still had. He wanted accessibility by interstate highways, which there was by then and there was going to be more. He also wanted a state government that was willing to give him a free hand. And uh, at that time, the state government of Florida was quite receptive to this. They were interested in competing with the uh, more established leaders in these in these realms um, and so disney chose florida because of these advantages and then after disney chose florida well that made orlando a big destination that's one of the one of the top two or three conference and and holiday destinations in the usa and so once orlando was that kind of destination well the American Automobile Association relocated there. Uh, this would have been circa 1980s. American Automobile Association is in Heathrow, Florida, which is near Orlando. And now once AAA was there and the Travtech uh, test came along, well, AAA wanted to be involved. And so that's another reason why the uh, Travtech experiment, the one where you had these Oldsmobiles going around with onboard navigation systems. Incidentally, those did not use satellites. They <laughs> used a rather elaborate mechanism that I won't get into. In any case, um, there were some chance reasons why that was done in Florida. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I did see you had a couple of other questions. I, if you don't mind, I'll read the other one. Um, why were competing transportation industries, so buses, trains, and monorails, less successful than the automotive industry? Did they lack the partnership planning strong narrative and vision that GM and other large automotive companies had? Were the successful tactics used by the automotive industry not used by the, uh, their competitors? So that was again from Rebecca. That's a fabulous question, Rebecca, and um, it, it predictably has a rather long and complicated answer. So I'm going to try to make it uh, as short uh, an answer as I can can manage. Um, so the the profitable product that Detroit produced, the most profitable product by far, was the passenger car. General Motors made electric streetcars. They made electric trains. They made buses. Um, they made a lot of different vehicles and they profited from those vehicles as well. But their biggest profit was from the passenger car. That was also the, the one best opportunity to try to oversell the customer. By that I mean you can get customers to pay extra for uh, a Buick or an Oldsmobile or a Cadillac. It's harder to convince a city to buy more bus than they need. Um, it's easier to get a consumer to do that, and General Motors was very adept at doing this. They actually had a whole department called the Styling Department committed entirely to trying to figure out how they could get people to pay more for a car than the car was actually worth. Now, there's some very interesting work that was done um, by the Automobile Manufacturers Association back in the 1930s, where they calculated among themselves, and I have the the reports that they wrote to each other. They said that we have a problem and they called that problem submerged demand. By that they meant that there were people who could afford passenger cars who were not buying them. And they said, okay, so what's the problem? And they looked at the problem and they found out the problem was the biggest in the following cities, New York, Boston, Milwaukee, Chicago. 
Uh, what do those cities have in common? Where they're, they're all dense cities with excellent public transportation systems. And they said, well, this is dooming us because we got a lot of rich people in Boston, Chicago, Milwaukee, etc., who would buy a car, except they don't need one. And so what we have to do instead is convince people that a future of safe driving and congestion-free driving requires a lot of big highways. This is where the foolproof highways idea came along. That was invented by uh, the Automobile Manufacturers Association. And uh, this in turn will generate a market because now people, uh, once they have these highways, um, will spread out and live beyond the reach of their transit systems. So I want to stress that there's money to be made selling transit. Uh, it's just that uh, the automobile manufacturers figured out early on that the real profitable future was in a future where everybody has a car. And that's what Futurama was really depicting. Thank you, Peter. Um, we had another question come in through the chat from Rich Glorendon, who said, granted that we have historically prioritized speed over safety and livability, but at what point does congestion become problematic and what would you do about it? That's an excellent question. Um, there's a lot of people who I think are more qualified to offer uh, good answers to that than I am. But since you've asked, I'll, I'll offer one. It's not really an original answer anyway. Uh, so I would say actually that we are not faced with, uh, let's say, mutually exclusive alternatives um, because we can have livable density. By livable density, I mean density where we are physically close to each other as residents and also physically close to our destinations, destinations like school, work, uh, grocery stores, and so on. We can be physically close to those in ways that are highly attractive. In fact, Americans' favorite holiday destination spots, uh, just taking the numbers, are the holiday destination spots where they can walk to their preferred destinations. Uh, certainly there are exceptions. A lot of people like to go to Vegas, but a lot of people like to go to Europe. A lot of people like to go to Mexico. A lot of people like to go to the Caribbean. And at those destinations, they typically find, uh, or they typically choose to go someplace where they can walk to their destinations. They may rent a car too, but they rent a car to go to other places and then have the pleasure of being able to walk to where they want. Density can be very livable. What is not very livable is even fairly low density with cars everywhere. And now you find yourself, as flir Floridians so often do, stuck sitting in traffic just because they have to pick something up at the drugstore uh, and there's no other way to get to the drugstore uh, so they're, they're stuck like that. So I think they can be compatible um, rather than antagonistic values. And I incidentally, since this is a planning audience, there's going to be a lot of people in this meeting who are or who know planners who specialize in making sure that we can have livable density, which is where we really need to go. Thanks again, Peter. And I, I know a lot of us are, you know, working towards that. So um, that's a, a great answer to that question. I had another question that uh, Corinne uh, texted me. So this is kind of a com combined question from Corinne and myself. Um, she asked, what was the, th uh, the thing that surprised you the most doing your research and writing your book? And uh, my question for you would be, what um, in this research maybe gave you the most hope for a better future? Wonderful pair of questions because uh, they kind of complement each other because the thing that surprised me most also was the thing that disturbed me the most. The thing that, dis and, and so that's the same thing for me. I was incredibly surprised to find the most bizarrely ridiculous claims getting credibility among investors. And I can only explain this as in the following sense. In other words, I think investors are must be smart people um, on average. And I think that the, the intellectual calculation must be, well, that's an absurd promise. 
but they're making it and other people are going to fall for it. And that means that there's going to be growth in this area for a while. And I want to get in on that growth while the growth is going on. Um, so, for example, I would have thought that a tagline like General Motors, which is saying that thanks to tech, we will have a future with zero crashes, zero emissions and zero congestion is like a parody, like an on, a headline from The Onion or a Saturday Night Live sketch, but it's not. And I don't, I really can't grasp that the absurdity of that ridiculous promise has any credibility. So that, and then also the fact that that was bizarrely similar to the promises of Futurama's one, two, and three also made me realize I have a book to write because while other people can expose the false promises, maybe I'm one of the few people who can connect those false promises to the previous three generations of false promises. Now, as to the hopeful part, um, as you uh, kindly mentioned, Katrina, in your introduction, I was a guest faculty member at a university in the Netherlands where I commuted every day to work by bike. And if you measured my commute only in terms of sort of values that we can easily quantify like money and time, uh, money not just for the vehicle but also for the road, uh, for everything else that made it possible, it was no contest. For me to drive a few miles to work was probably a hundred times more resource intensive for, than for me to bike a couple of miles to work every day and it was a joy and I got healthier every day. And I figured out that riding in the rain is just a matter of adapting a little bit. It's not a big deal. The list goes on. It was, it was a real delight. And not only that, but the cycling was integrated with public transportation so that if I needed a bus or I needed a train and I needed a bike that all worked together, thanks to what they have there called public transit bikes, which are much more affordable than the, the bike share bikes that we have in the US in some cities. So I thought that gives me hope if we could be have the humility that we need as a country to admit that we have something to learn from other countries. Uh, I think we can learn from that example. Also to conclude this long answer, planners like the people in this group give me a lot of hope. I hear from planners frequently and a lot of the best ideas I've encountered I'm talking full spectrum innovation ideas that are zero tech, low tech, high tech, or any combination thereof. Uh, these ideas are coming from planners and uh, they need the support of the public. And that's, I see as part of my mission to get that support. That was a wonderful answer. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Um, I mean, you got the both sides of it, you know, the, the thing that surprised you and disturbed you, but then also that hope for right. the future. And um, for anybody on this call that did receive the free book, I, or free signed book, I loved your, um, what you signed into the book. So um, that Thank was you. wonderful. And uh, I'm not at this time seeing any more questions coming through. So um, unless someone would like to go ahead and pop up, feel free to raise your hand. Um, I think we'll go ahead and conclude, but uh, Peter, thank you so much. Oh, okay, Rebecca, I see Rebecca has a question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> One last question, just because I'm, it's just curiosity and it really doesn't have anything to do with like planning or anything. It's just in the book I noticed on one page, um, page 189, you give this example of a person living outside of the city lacking this choice in transportation. And in the example, the person is a woman, you give the pronouns of she, her. And I was wondering if this was a conscious decision or not, like whether that was intentional or not. I love the question because I do have to think about these things as, as I'm writing. Now, uh, I'm 58, so I grew up with English teachers or school teachers who said, well, if you don't know the gender, you say he, and he is the all-purpose gender. So. Uh, we have moved on since those days, and I think for good reason. So personally, I decided in situations like that, where the gender could be either one, to go by chance, although actually it's not pure chance, I would start with she as a kind of compensation for that long old practice where the default was he. So if there had been another example, I might have picked he. Now, it, it does 
have a statistical validity to it that the people who t it's more likely that a woman will be disadvantaged by car dependent urban design than a man will be that's a lot less true in 2022 than it used to be as recently well this may not sound like recently to most of you but uh, in the 1960s for example men drove about twice as much as women did and most families that had a car had one car only very often the man monopolized it. So there's a good reason to depict the person who's disadvantaged most by the status quo as being a woman. In that case, it was just chance. And had I needed another example, a paragraph later, I probably would have used he. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm seeing a, a comment in the chat here. Really appreciated the fantastic presentation and discussion slash Q&A. Looking forward to reading the book. Thanks so much. So I think that really um, shows uh, the appreciation we have for you for um, coming to this event. And uh, I see, I think, uh, Rich, is that, is that a hand up or just a clapping? <laughs> I'm not sure what the emoji there. I think it, it must be a clapping emoji. Um, but uh, as you can see in the chat, Corinne is saying thank you again for joining us tonight. And um, as a reminder, this has been recorded. So if anybody had to pop out early or you know somebody you'd love to share this um, presentation with, please feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, we also have CM credits available and Corinne put the number uh, in the chat there. So um, again, thank you, Peter, so much for joining us. And thank you, Corinne, for all your planning. And we hope that uh, we will uh, be able to talk about this book moving forward uh, amongst ourselves here in the Suncoast section of Florida. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Katrina, thank you. And thank you, uh, Corinne. And thank you, everyone else, for your interest. It's very gratifying to me as a historian who just has a kind of a nerdy interest to discover that there are other people who see some use in it. That's really rewarding, especially for planners. And so let me just close by saying uh, it really is an honor to be in common cause for a better future with all of you. Uh, thank you for your hospitality and your generosity with your attention. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. You too. I'll bye bye. <laughs>